Hey church, welcome to uh, what is our second last Thursday devotion for the year. Um, yeah, looking forward to kicking off more next year. You'll hear more about that um, in coming weeks. Uh, but this is our second last one before we have a break over the Christmas uh, holiday time. So we're continuing uh, our journey through the book of Esther. Uh, now remember Esther is set in Persia, uh, where many of the Jews are still in exile. Uh, we see lots of feasting, uh, lots of twists of fate. We see sweet, sweet irony for the Jews. But what we don't see is the name of God mentioned at all, remember. But as the book unfolds, we see his hand at work through it all, the unmistakable work of a sovereign and loving God, uh, knowing that there's no such thing as coincidence in a divine economy. And being helpfully reminded that even when God seems absent, his hand is still at work. So let's sort of recap where we're up to. Um, Esther, a young Jewish woman, is chosen as the new queen through a beauty contest. Uh, and meanwhile, Mordecai, her cousin, he uncovers a plot uh, to assassinate the king. Uh, Esther's identity as a Jew is kept secret. Uh, and then Haman, an official in the king's court, uh, plots to exterminate all the Jews, wants to kill them all because Mordecai refuses to bow down to him. Now, this leads to to Mordecai urging Esther to reveal her heritage and to intercede with the king on their behalf. And she bravely agrees, risking her life. And then when the king says, what do you need? She sets up a series of banquets with him and with Haman. Uh, and while waiting for the second banquet, the king is reminded that Mordecai saved his life. And so he commands Haman to publicly honour Mordecai. And Haman's pretty upset about this. So to console himself, he erects a pole on which he plans to impale Mordecai. Uh, today, we are in the third of the four acts uh, in the book of Esther, and the stage is set. <clears throat> Haman and the king are on their way to Esther's final banquet. She's no doubt terrified about the consequences of revealing her heritage when there's this upcoming edict to kill all of her people. And we're holding our breath along with Mordecai and all the Jews in Persia as they await their fate as well. So press pause and have a read now of chapters 7 and 8 of Esther, and see what happens next. Esther chapter 7 and 8. <clears throat> well, all right, so let's recap on that, right? At the banquet, Esther reveals her Jewish identity and she tells the king how Haman had tricked him into making this edict to annihilate the Jews. And the king is furious uh, and makes matters worse. He thinks that uh, then uh, Haman is trying to put some moves on Esther. And so he furiously, uh, in a drunken rage, gets Haman and impales him on the pole uh, intended for Mordecai's impaling. That's sweet irony, right? And then Mordecai is elevated to the king's right hand. We then learn that since the original decree can't be overturned to kill all the Jews, another decree is issued so that the Jews can defend themselves, hopefully deterring any attacks. And uh, also the Jews are able to kill anyone who plotted against them. And so then the Jews celebrate. Uh, and chapter 8 verse 17 tells us that many people of other nationalities became Jews when they saw uh, what God has done. What a reversal. Now, uh, I'd like to chat about the issues surrounding the counter decree, like the revenge and killing, etc. But we're going to do that next week. And the one thing that jumps out to me this week, uh, well, the biggest thing that jumps out to me is the fulfillment of the words of Haman's wife and advisors back in chapter 6 verse 13. I don't know if you remember that last week, but uh, they warn him, they say um, to Haman, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. They say that, right? And, and then this prophecy comes true. Because uh, the Bible constantly reminds us that opposition to God is stupidity. It's called foolishness all throughout wisdom literature, but it's, it's, it's stupidity. Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, sum this attitude of stupidity up. It says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their scoff, uh, shackles. Verse 4, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. God laughs at all of our plans to oppose him. See it in the Garden of Eden, the Tower of Babel, 400 years in Egypt, the wandering in the desert, the exiles in Babylon and Persia. God always wins. Anytime people try to thwart his plan, he, he has a retort. He knows what he's doing and he brings it uh, to, uh, to, to be. At the end of Genesis, Joseph, uh, after rising up from slavery uh, to enter Pharaoh's courts where he saves Egypt and uh, consequently Israel from famine, 
He says to the brothers who sold him into slavery, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Well, this is repeated. This idea is repeated throughout God's word. God laughs at evil and turns it into good. And the greatest example is Jesus, right? Crucified, uh, only to bring forgiveness of sins. And then rising again to be installed as king. Psalm 2 also speaks of this, right? God says in verse 6, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. That's why he's laughing. God's appointed ruler, Jesus, is in control. Despite what others think, and despite what our circumstances may tell us. And we're reminded that God still works like this. God still turns evil into good. When we read Romans 8.28, Paul says this. We know that in all things, all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So that's the head knowledge. That's something we've learned from the passage. It's quite profound. But what about the heart and the hands? How do we respond to this knowledge? Well, Personally, the last few days have been pretty hectic for me um, in an extended family level. And um, so my emotional response, when I read this, I feel this sense of peace and relief. God wins. His purposes will prevail. I really need to hear this right now because the circumstances in, in the world at large and also uh, in my extended family are telling me otherwise. God wins. So as you think on it, how do you respond emotionally? And practically, well, if God wins and if God's purposes prevail, then how can you respond with your actions? Well, I think it's as simple as getting on God's level, being about the things God is about. What does he value? What does his kingdom look like? These are the things with eternal significance, the things that will will out. So we are called to do what God wants us to do, to live in line with his values and his kingdom. And this calls for repentance. Repentance is turning, turning back to God. See, um, maybe you're not a Christian, you've never repented. Uh, the call is to repent from living your own way and go Jesus' way. He is the ruler. Don't plot against him. It's, a, it's not going to lead you anywhere. And maybe you are a Christian. And to repent is this is an ongoing process of assessing your actions. And through the power of his spirit, bring them in line with God's values. I'd love to uh, chat about any of those, so give us a call or comment on this or send me an email and we can chat more about what it looks like for you to repent for the first time or maybe in an ongoing way, please. But back to Psalm 2, we're told how to respond to God's King, Jesus. Verses 10 to 12, Therefore you kings, you people who plot against God, be wise, be warned, you rulers of earth, serve the Lord with fear, that's respect, right, and celebrate his rule with trembling, kiss his son, or he'll be angry. And your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. Whoever you are, we're called to be wise and kiss God's son. That means to submit to Jesus' rule. And when we do, we will find refuge in him and we will be blessed. God always wins. As we conclude, I just want to pray our prayer today, which is adapted from Psalm 2. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you humbly recognising the brokenness and evil in this world. The nations may conspire, the rulers may plot, but we find solace in the assurance that you reign supreme. We lift our eyes to Zion, your holy mountain, where through his life, death, resurrection and ascension, Jesus reigns forever. And we rejoice in the decree that the nations are his inheritance, the ends of the earth, his possession, all belongs to him. And we look forward to the day when this reality will be made complete. May our rulers, our leaders, but also each of us as individuals heed the wisdom echoed in Psalm 2. Let us serve you with fear. Let us celebrate your rule with trembling and in humility. Kiss your son. May we recognise that ref refuge is found in you alone. And so as we head, in, head into the day, may your blessing rest upon us and may we, your people, ever take refuge in the shadow of your loving embrace. Amen.